Hello and welcome back to the e-commerce uncovered podcast. I'm your somewhat excitable host, Matt Lady. I'm here wearing a just keep scaling shirt, and I'm here more importantly here with my guest Raba, and he is wearing an also equally cool kind of Pink Panther kind of shirt. Yes, yeah, the pink, pink Panther baby, vintage. Love it. My th- okay, how? Can I'm just kidding. I was going to make some like, question about how can brand owners pull from Pink Panther? Uh, to, There's a lot there. To, yeah, but uh, welcome to the show. It's great to, great to have you. And let's um, talk about metrics and KPIs that early brand owners should be focused on. Well, as an early brand owner, either you have an e-commerce background, maybe you don't. Uh, you're not sure what's going on. You're you're just reading what you can. You don't maybe you don't have a, a coach or guidance or sure. You know, like what would you tell a first time founder to like what are a few metrics to focus on? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, uh, particularly pertinent seeing with the uh, privacy changes with iOS 14, and ultimately, I would say whether you're a new brand or an established brand, you essentially care about the same six metrics. The one bifurcation I would say there is as you get bigger, your optimization matters more because a 1% bump on 100 orders a month isn't going to matter, but a 1% bump in your conversion rate on 10,000 orders a month can substantially change the complexion of a business. But with that being said, so there's actually an article we can link to in the show notes, but we care about three things as marketers. We care about efficiency, effectiveness, and profits. What's happened now in the marketing ecosystem is all the channel metrics, so what Facebook's telling you, what Snapchat's telling you, what Google's telling you, are no longer accurate or precise. And so what happens is you need to abstract to a higher level, uh, what we call channel agnostic metrics. And so there's three of those that we care about. One is ecosystem ROAS, or somebody, some people uh, refer to it as MER. So ultimately, that's the total amount of revenues that you've had divided by the total ad spend that you've spent. And so that can give you a really nice look into how effective your ads are or your paid media. The second one is new customer ROAS. So as you deploy media, you should really only be spending paid media on one, the highest value customers and two, pretty much new customers, your email, your SMS, your community, all these other things should really start to convert that cohort. And you should really be using your paid media on prospecting essentially and so a good way to measure that is what we call nc roas or new customer roas and so all that is is the new customer revenue for that time frame over the total ad spend boom and again this is why it matters so much to have channel agnostic metrics is because there's no delayed attribution there's no this is what's in your shopify store like this is money in your shopify store and so that's why it matters and then the last thing where you can really get down to it is especially for these new store owners more so because every dollar matters is what we call poas and so that's profit on ad spend and so what you're doing there is you're taking the net profits divided by the total ad spend. And so those are the three kind of channel agnostic metrics we use to evaluate the health of an ecosystem. And then the other three metrics we care about that are more core to the business are revenues, obviously, um, net profits and net margin. Net profits and net margin are essentially the same thing, just expressed in a absolute and a percentage. But, um, yeah, so that's what we, we have a three row as to rule them all actually in, uh, analytics programs, triple L that I work for. Um, that's really easy to see all that stuff, but those are the things I would work, work to improve. Not to say like channel metrics aren't important, but you should really only use them for directionality. Like, are they going up or are they going down? Cause at the end of the day, if you're making more money when you're scaling your ads, even though you don't know why it's working, like you shouldn't stop that. I'm not saying you shouldn't try and figure out why that's working, but you shouldn't be like, oh, well, I don't understand this, so I should stop making money. Like, no, 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 don't do that. Like as long as your ads are driving more revenue and with those three metrics, and I'm kind of droning on here, but with those three ROAS, there's nothing that will fall outside of something that'll be catastrophic to the business because you know how effective your ads are with your ecosystem ROAS. How much is an ad spend dollar pushing actual revenues, attribution aside? And then you know how efficient am I activating new customers with your new customer ROAS? And then you know how profitable is my business? And so it gets into kind of like a little bit of a P&L and stuff, but I've kind of dubbed this era kind of like a mini CMO where there's a lot of really awesome media buyers that are, I don't want to say ignorant because that sounds like a pejorative, but don't have the 
basic understandings of essentially the three big financials of a P&L or a profit loss, a balance sheet, and your cash flow statement. And so not... And again, this also kind of butts up against, um, and I'll stop my rant here, but it butts up against also, if you're an agency that's more so channel specific, it's really hard to partner at that P&L level because the incentives get really perverted, where like a percent of spend, there's no judgment on it. I, I think it can be a great model for a lot of people, um, but there's just a lot of... Um, weirdness there also to be fair as a media buyer or a partner there's going to be some things on the PL that like at the operational level that you're really not going to have a lot of input on that could dis- be destroying your net profits as well so there is some caveats to it but to kind of land the plane matt i would say look at those three roas so your poas your nc roas and your ecosystem roas slash mer and then you're always going to care about your revenues your net margins and your net profits that was incredible first five minutes <laughs> <laughs> uh love that we could stop it clip it yeah there, the, the george costanza right just yeah. leave that's it i'm done that's it. we'll wrap it up uh <laughs> but i'd want to call out a few things and ask you and push you to explain more on a few things yeah you didn't mention aov and conversion rate why is that so yeah, those definitely matter, but those are more at a tactical level, right? So you're not going to change AOV in the next day or two. Same with conversion rate. The other thing that conversion rate, so conversion rate hundred percent matters. And if there's a one thing you wanted to focus your resources on conversion rates, a great one. The other thing about conversion rate is it can be a bit of set it and forget it. Once you find a nice golden path in conversion, it can be, you know, an upfront investment, if you will. So, and then there's very little variable costs for that. Um, AOV. So great question about AOV. So again, shameless triple whale plug. There's yeah. three ways to look at AOV. And so in triple whale, we built, so there's the mean, the median, and the mode. So the mean AOV is what it's proper AOV, what people are like reference AOV. And that's just total spend or excuse me, total purchase value divided by total order. So how, what's the average order value? Now, the other two things you want to care about, you don't just want to look at AOV. You also want to look at median AOV, which is going to be the center of that data set. So your center purchase value, if you will. And then the real important one that you hear a little bit of smattering talking about it, but it's called mode AOV. And what the mode value is, it's the most frequent value in that data set. And the reason that's important is if you have a disparity. So I have a client that has essentially a 60-ish dollar, excuse me, 60-ish dollar AOV, 50, 60-ish dollar, very similar median. But his mode AOV is 20 bucks. And so we've had a huge challenge in activating paid media efficiently because that mode value is going to be the most probable value you're going to get from a paid media, especially because we don't run any retargeting. So this is just on prospecting. And so AOV matters, but AOV, you want to look at it in those three lenses, not just through that one lens of mean AOV. And conversion rate absolutely matters, and you should absolutely uh, nail down on that. But I... Like, I think conversion rate is definitely a metric, but I see it more so as a refined process. And so as you get that process refined, there's going to be other things that can move the lever outside of the infrastructural, like proper having shop pay hooked up, having a really nice process. Like you can also improve your conversion rate by bringing in better leads, right? Like better web traffic, people that are more aligned to the product and the the pitch per se and the offer than um, just proper cold traffic. So uh, great pushback and AOV is definitely important, but you want to look at it through three lenses, not just that one lens and a conversion rate you should absolutely be watching, but it's, it's one of the harder levers to move and it takes a longer amount of time to move. And there's, as you get bigger and bigger, your sophistication in experiments has to increase because there's just a lot of confounding factors to really pull out why the lift happened, if that makes any sense. It does. It, so yeah. it's one of those things that you can set up and iterate and improve and tweak over time. Uh, but once you find that path that works, it works. You kind of, like you said, it's an upfront investment. So that's, that's really good to know. And it's good to know that there are other metrics. I was just asking you about the ones you would tell a first-time founder on. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, like the ones to focus on first. So, uh, you've mentioned Triple Whale a couple times. Uh, yeah. I am a big fan. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I try to get every single one of my clients on it. It helps me step away from in-platform Facebook ROAS, which is n- not accurate at all. Suspect <laughs> is best, yeah. Uh, yeah questionable at best uh 
So tell us a little bit about Triple Whale, and I know you just you've been with them for a while, but tell us a little bit about how you joined the team and all that too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the layup. Uh, so cool story. Uh, Triple Whale, kind of what we were talking about a little bit offline before the pod was uh, how how incredible Twitter is as just a networking tool. And so I had been following AJ. Um, I had f- heard some cool things about this. I had been a diehard. Uh, I, I roll my own dashboard. So Google Data Studio, hooking it up with all these APIs, yada, yada, yada. Um, and I still love it and it's great. But what Triple Whale gave me is basically an abstraction of what I've built, simpler, and there's a mobile app. And so one of the things that I kind of slept on was the mobile app. And so being able to get kind of a, a a quick view of my whole business versus like, so if you're running TikTok ads, you can't even see TikTok spend on mobile or performance on mobile. Um, and so it pulls in all that stuff and it aligns with all the kind of metrics like we were talking about, those three rows to rule them all, those channel agnostic metrics. Um, so that's why I like it. Super awesome. I can rant on it more, but I don't want to turn it to an advert. But um, the way I joined was uh, going back to Twitter. Um, it was actually my first private investment. And then AJ and Max, the two co-founders, got to know them more or fantastic people, um, the vision, the timing, everything kind of just worked out and then uh, joined the team doing some kind of, you know, in, in a way, um, testing it out, so to speak. And then, um, yeah, just recently I came on as the CMO. So that's that. CMO of Triple Whale. Now, yeah. are, you, uh, are you planning like an excursion to go capture and like find some whales as mascots? Or is that like, am I way off base? No, so it's interesting you say that. We have been toying about with uh, a Wally the Whale mascot that we might spin up, kind of like a Clippy or a Reddit alien or the the Twitter bird, that kind of thing. So it, it's interesting you touch on that. But in terms of the live excursions, not yet. Maybe we can have like a, a team meet in the Galapagos or something and, ha- you know, keep keep it going. But uh, if you're on our newsletter or do use the product and have any of the onboarding stuff, we do get, get fairly punny. So th- there's definitely that. Awesome. Yeah, love it. Like, gotta have some fun. Gotta, gotta brighten the day, smile a little bit during all this business nonsense. Uh, totally, totally. Totally, man. Okay. So you got the metrics. You got a little about Triple Whale, CMO. I was just talking with uh, Ian Leslie from Twitter. He, he joined Bolt a while ago. Yeah, um, I love Bolt. Yeah, he, um, he was talking about mini CMO and like, like this concept as well so it's just interesting how it's like coming up more and more um now as an early founder like he on a bootstrap budget like not yeah. not vc backed um wh- where do i start with market like uh, say i have a product i have a brand i'm six months in i have 100k in revenue six months yep. in i have a basic product Standard, nothing luxury, nothing to like five dollar cheap e either. Standard, whatever. Say it's an apparel brand. Like, sure. I'm trying to give you some constraints because I asked this question and everyone's just like, it depends. So I'm trying yeah, to yeah. fill in some of these. Um, what like, what would you tell me? Like, I okay, like I want to, I want to focus more on marketing. I have a few hours a week as a founder uh, to, I can do marketing, but I'm not a marketing person. To begin yeah. with, like yeah. what advice, what resources, what guidance would you start to impart on, on someone in my position? Yeah, fantastic question. And the constraints are very helpful. Um, <laughs> so the first thing I would start with would be obviously the complexion of your business, right? So you, you gave me the run rate of 100K, but we need to see like how do you generate that 100K and what that going back to those AOVs. So again, shameless plug, throw it in triple whale, get all this data. The next thing I would look at is a 60, 90 day LTV as well to kind of see just what I know you said six months. So it, it, you would have that data, uh, you know, ish. And so from that, I think personally, you shouldn't start paid media until you're about 25 to 30% revs of email. So I'd really focus in on email and building evangelists and really making sure that the people that use your product love your product and getting money out of those people with email. Now, if you were just really hot and bothered to start paid, a lot of times you just don't have the budget to make the math work. And so what I would recommend is 
clustering or concentrating that budget into either a giveaway or some sort of like offer that you'll run for two weeks or something like that. That way you can actually, you know, even if you're spending a hundred, 200 bucks a day, you can still make the math work ish. But if you're spending like 50 to a hundred bucks a day, it's just going to be a big challenge to, even if you do succeed to really succeed because the, the way the algorithm works, it just, the, the math just doesn't net out where you're, you're not going to get conversions at a dollar or $2. Like at best, you're going to be 10, $15 kind of thing. And so again, that's why I, I don't like hard and fast rules, but really that $50 AOV, um, can be helpful to navigate because sometimes you're just pushing up against economics. And one of the biggest rules in paid media is if you can't, play the, or if you can't win the game don't play and so that that's kind of i think a lot of people are really hot on the trigger in terms of paid media where i would concentrate on really building a robust email and then honestly tertiary to that would be um community so first get your revenues in place which sounds like you have second get your email and retention in place to make sure that the people you do have you're getting more money out of Third, use a community to build evangelists. And then from that, you can kind of springboard into paid. But outside of that, like, I think, and I'll go on my one little soapbox rant. In the last two to five years, so to speak, paid media has been so bullish in terms of the, the market. So if you had any semblance of, you know, best practices and a decent offer and your website work, you're going to print money. I mean, it just was what it was. And so there's a funny line where, Everybody looks like a genius in a bull market. And I think a little bit of that happened. And not only that, there's been this huge paradigm shift with iOS 14 where channel metrics are no longer reliable in in terms of accuracy or precision. And so all that kind of is a confluence of this output. And I I see a lot of people as well where um, just the traditional agency models are buttoned up against a new paradigm. And so I just know a lot of friends that left agencies that are running two, four clients making twice as much with way less headache because not only do they, they're just closer to the client. They're, they're that more partnership stuff because I can charge five grand a month and be fine versus the agency needs that 10% because it just has tons of overhead. And to be fair, you know, these people that I know we we're talking about these like mini CMOs, they can't really get paid at agency that much like there's just a value ceiling that they'll be able to create for that agency that they're like you're getting in a c-suite kind of salaries and they're like you won't be able to create that value there so um i think it's a a a big mix i kind of meandered everywhere but (laughs) it's all good man no i super appreciate and like how you (laughs) are a media buyer and you're like don't media buy yet (laughs) don't like put money in facebook yet i like that yeah yeah, I mean, and I would say like I'm a marketer, right? And so yeah. like a media buying is more so a tactic and it just has gotten conflated with like media buying is marketing, like buying billboards, you know, doing organic market. There's all these other email, it's marketing. So I think that kind of, uh, yeah, don't start paid until 30% email. If you don't know how to run email, Chase Diamond has a wonderful course. I'll plug him. He's a fantastic human. And it's a great course. Get, get up to speed there. But to land the, <clears throat> to land the plane again, Matt, I would say, uh, concentrate on email, concentrate on community. If you do want to do some paid media, try and cluster and concentrate that budget so you can have more bursts versus trying to paper cut yourself to death and just lighten $20 bills on fire. Love it. That's super helpful, super tangible and actionable. Community is another buzzword that is starting to get thrown a lot around a lot more. And I'm not calling you out on it. I am calling out the topic. Um, community can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people Fair and point. for you what does it mean and then that, let's start there and then i'll follow up yeah so i'll give you kind of the the academic political answer first and yeah. then my real answer yeah. so com- community is just a place an area that you can allow and give narratives to your customers that can then foster them into evangelists like that's kind of the ultimate end game for me as a community is like uh, so kind of small digression here because we were talking about the psychological stuff on the the thread (laughs) there's something called uh, uh, a way of thinking of products called jobs to be done and jobs to be done basically the too long didn't read is you don't hire products you or you don't buy products you hire them to do jobs and there's three ways that that like job can manifest or three vectors if you will it's emotional functional and social and i think that the more you get down to that job to be done the easier it is to build a community because you give people this narrative like, oh, I use Triple Well because 
every media buyer uses it. Or right, like there, there's these things like, why do you tell your significant other that you bought this thing? Or it, it doesn't need to be factual, but it does need to have this compelling narrative. And I think that's what the function of community should be is not only make it inclusive, but make that person feel smart that they bought your product or service. Make that person feel like successful. And, and that's this huge thing for me in terms of community. So that's my big political, if I'd say it, I talk. What community is, is essentially contextual to you and how it manifests is also contextual to you. And so like for a couple clients, there's a private Facebook group. I know people run in super successful Discord channels. Um, Slack is great. It's not a great community tool. It's a great communication tool, but building the community in there, the economics get real sketchy. As your community builds, you get essentially get punished for that. Um, OG email newsletters, like that's an absolute community that you can build. And there's podcasts and newsletters. If you write them in a personal way and podcasts can be super compelling because you feel like you know the person, right? Especially if you have it come from a byline versus a brand. And so I think that's one thing that sometimes in bigger companies, you don't have that, you know, leeway to do that. But in smaller companies, absolutely try and like that person isn't necessarily like the face of the brand, but there's a human behind it and it can connect more because at the end of the day, this is a social activity, right? It's a social thing. And so connecting with a human or even kind of anthropomorphizing a mascot, like we were talking about Wally the whale or something like that. Like, I think that's really helpful in generating community, but I, I do take your point and it can be a fairly nebulous thing. And the thing I'll wrap up on is a lot of times... I have this kind of theory called proximity of profit. <clears throat> and so the closer you are to the profit, the less likely you're get to, you're, the less likely you are to get fired. And so when you think of organic or community building, it's so far from profits. It's usually either the first thing to start or the last thing to start or first thing to go. And, and so I think that's where a lot of tension comes from where if your PL is starting to get spicy, you can point to your media buyer and your media buyer is going, hey, this is what I'm making for you. This is what you're paying me. Okay, cool. You can point to your email person. Hey, you're driving. You're, the deltas are going up. Okay, cool. And then you go to the social person. You're like, yeah, engagement's up. But it's just all vanity metrics that it's really hard to tie that to profits. And at the end of the day, like you, that's really what you care about as a business. You don't really care about you know m- making evangelists. The reason you care about making evangelists is because they're a means to an end where they're going to buy more of your stuff and then it starts this really symbiotic loop. So that's kind of my thoughts on community. The the, the real queen, we're actually having her on uh, the podcast soon, uh, Christina Garnett of HubSpot. She should answer that question. I'll ask her that question on the podcast because that's a fantastic, fantastic question, Matt. Perfect. I will, uh, I'll take credit for that one when you uh, ask her. Be like, oh, Matt, lady, this is... Uh, this cool guy. I'll, I'll absolutely <laughs> drop you in that. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> name drop you. Awesome. Well, cool. Um, that, love love that answer, and I love how you took it. Um, if going back to, and I know that you, okay, so as that early brand owner, that founder, community, like how do I, again, I have a few hours. I have two hours a week to yeah. commit to community <clears throat> because – I'm picking up steam and there's like loyal customers and VIPs are starting to like raise raise their hands or keep buying stuff. And I notice in Shopify that they're standing out, right? Where do I even start to begin to narrow in on what community might look like for me at this stage as a solo founder? Yeah. Great question. So ultimately I think you should start, we kind of talked about the email base, but there's also some things you can do that are like synchronous slash asynchronous. So, for example, this was a fashion brand that you said. So you could run a weekly Facebook Live or Instagram Live, wherever your audience is, just showing off your clothes, making a community there. You can have an AMA with the founder, which you would be there. So there's different kind of little tactical things. The biggest thing about community is it's a plant and you have to water it on a consistent cadence. And so if you break that once, so one, you want to get people to enter into the pack where it's like a newsletter. Hey, for us, it's Tuesday and Thursday. We tell people we won't send anything more than that. Anything less you're in or out. Once you violate that kind of trust and pact, it can be really off putting in terms of community building. So I would say that is a caveat, but at the beginning, cadence is your friend. Like the more you post, the better you're going to have crap stuff. But the beautiful thing about having crap stuff is you're at the beginning. And so nobody has this huge expectation for you to have a ton of production value. And quite frankly, there's a lot of things that 
the production value is more for the marketer or the business to say that they got a video done by XYZ Studio than it is at all about the efficacy. And so, you know, don't get caught up in the ego stuff and just do. And that, like, that would be the biggest, like, too long didn't read for advice of the brand owner just starting is just do like action breeds action. You're going to break stuff. It's going to be fine. But the biggest thing are you need to make sure that people buy your product. You need to make sure that people that are buying your product love your product. Those are the two things that can build you momentum. Once you get momentum, the biggest thing is keep the momentum. If you lose it, how do you get it again? And you just basically repeat that cycle, but in bigger loops as you get bigger scale. And as you get bigger scale and grow and actually start to become not the only person at the brand and start to hire, that might start to evolve and uh, iterate. And it might change over time of what that initial community looks like <clears throat> compared to when you're at 2 million versus 100 grand, right? Like very big difference there potentially. So good yep. to note. Good to, good to note that. <laughs> what is one thing that you wish you knew when you started marketing whenever that was yeah yeah that you know now what's one thing that you think would be a game changer for yourself there, there it's kind of a twofold answer one's yeah, a bit yeah. philosophical meta and the other one's more tactical um one is i've realized nobody really knows what they're doing even like the top i, I know some real crushers and some of their verticals and like even then like you're just like wow and so don't be so hard on yourself but also don't breed complacency again like action breeds action and keep just trying and it sounds cheesy but the the thing that i would wish i would have known was just that like i had imposter syndrome for a really long time where i was like oh my gosh and like there, there's that old uh, what is it uh, saturday night live with the blue oyster cult where it's like oh he puts his pants on one leg at a time just like everybody else and really that's it man there's there's people that amplify scale there's people that do these things but at the end of the day i think uh humility and framing everything in a hypothesis framework helps you stay away from generating beliefs and beliefs are bad because when you have beliefs they're no longer attackable or approachable because if you believe that now if i say well facebook realized kind of doesn't matter matt you're like well i that's how i buy and like whoa okay like th there's nothing productive there when you have beliefs and so having that more hypo hypothetical like oh i this is the thesis and we're going to try this and then how does it pan out is kind of a better way to approach things and then the kind of tactical level that i would say was i didn't realize how important like economics would be and how shunned they are from marketing because that's what i went to school for was economics and so i was kind of really shocked especially when you get in the so when i was at an agency um we had a bunch of vc back big big companies with just super big balance sheets and like the economics just didn't work man like i saw all this stuff i know how this stuff works you're, like, you're acquiring somebody for a hundred two hundred dollars at best they're going to spend fifty dollars with you maybe and you're not even acquiring them for a purchase. You're acquiring from, you, you know what I mean? We, we joked about at the agency, we called it LA math, where it's just like, this <laughs> doesn't <laughs> I, I'll carry the one, but guys, I mean, this is like, it doesn't work. Um, and so I, I, I kind of dovetailing with that mini CMO era, I, I would say like it, I, I kind of lucked into it because that's what I studied. But if I was starting now, I think media buying tactics are less important to understanding the impact of the paid media on the business, if that makes sense. And you can't do that unless you understand how P&L works, what contribution margin is, cash conversion cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that that would be kind of um, if I was starting out again, I would really focus on some sort of uh, higher level understanding of the economics, at least, of you know, DTC or you don't need to get into cohorting and stuff unless you're doing trials and stuff like that can get fairly complex but just understanding how to run a pnl um and it's a great upsell for again going into more of a partnership mode versus an agency mode where it's like hey we're going to make you more money and we're going to tell you where your money's going and so um yeah it was a super long-winded answer but a great question <laughs> oh, good man well i'm glad it was a good question um, you had a great answer um so i like that it's just so true man like we all naturally want to be liked and accepted and feel safe 
And when someone challenges our own beliefs, or we see someone else's beliefs that don't match ours, we want to. We there's friction, there's tension. So I love that point about the imposter syndrome, and everyone, even the big cats, don't fully know what they're doing. Uh, we're all we're <laughs> one one way I put it. I liked, and I don't know why I'm saying this now, but is every day we wake up, we're all the oldest we've ever been. Yep. <laughs> and yep. the next day, with the next day, so it's like. We're all running a race, and we're all kind of figuring out as we go. So I love that point. And the second point about, dude, the math the math just doesn't work. I've had to tell clients that and turn people away. I'm like, uh, I cannot I cannot get you an 11x row S on prospecting <laughs> at scale. Like, please, like, like your gross margin, like, ugh. like, and I'm not uh, I'm not a huge math guy, and like I'm still learning in that area, but I know the basics, and it's like, ugh. like. I can run it. I'll, you'll just lose money. Like you can exactly. hire me, but you're gonna lose money, and I feel bad. And so I always tell people that. So uh, <laughs> love love that point as well about the money and the math working out. Doing doing the Lord's work <laughs> over their math. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, and to be fair, like it, it, you're in a privileged position to say no, right? Like if you need clients and stuff like that, it is what it is. But yeah. um, at, at the end of the day, you're going to net out to just a horrible situation because one, you're going to be super stressed. And then two, you understand that, hey, there's no way for me to make this work. Like, like it's not even if I'm the best media buyer in the world, like this isn't going to work. And so having that communication up front, what I've found too can be um, also a closing strategy where it's like, it's like the server that doesn't recommend the most expensive dish, but the best <laughs> dish. You're like, hey, like my, you're hiring me to make you more money. And what this investment is going to do, it's not going to make you more money. Here's some ways we can, you know, maneuver that investment where if you want to spend this much, we can try and again, like concentrate it or what have you. But these economics and these expectations are not realistic. And if they say no and you say no, like everybody's for the better of it. And you can kind of use your energies for a client that you can help versus just pounding your wall against this person that – and I've done that cause in the past. I've had to. And what you realize is it's just the, the worst. And as a small agency, one bad client can really scuttle a business. They're late to pay. Everything's bad. Even when you're succeeding, they'll move the go posts. Like it can just be a really challenging experience that – quite frankly is like more expensive than it is losing that revenue yes and that's i think an excellent little uh layup back to me for the alley and the oop uh <laughs> moving back into the, uh the next topic <laughs> is i okay my clothing brand from that 100k i listened to your advice raba and i took off i blew up yeah. i'm at yeah. 500 grand now in, in the next six months so one year in 500 grand i'm flying by the seat of my pants I am starting to look to like outsource fulfillment. I'll be looking to hire on someone. Agency versus in-house. Ooh. Tell me about agency versus in-house at this point in time, in this early stage. Yes. For, for and you can pick like marketing for fulfillment yeah. for website. You can like define it. So yeah. So fulfillment, I would definitely carve off as soon as you can as economically feasible um because third party will just it just makes your life so much easier because that essentially just becomes a cog that runs and you don't have to worry about that if something breaks the fulfillment company's off the hook you're not um so i would definitely uh, try and figure out how to make my fulfillment not only as i scaled up so i can get cost breaks but also make make it as automated as possible and have some somebody just watching over that because that's a big big one but in terms of agency and i think again the big tension comes between the incentives and so at us as a i guess we can break down the economics real quick so normally there's a few ways you would charge so an agency would normally charge at uh, a percent of spend so what that means for people is so say matt's company spends fifty thousand dollars um for the month um he would pay the eight rob's agency five grand okay cool the good thing about that for the agency's perspective is they have participation in the upside. And a lot of times an agency will have a minimum as well to have a backstop where it's like, okay, we take 10% of spend or a minimum of 10, 10K. So for the, going back to the 50K example, you would, even though you only spent $50,000 at 10%, so that'd be 5K, you would still pay that agency $10,000 because they have that minimum backstop. Um, and again, that's not a horrible model. The, the what I've found, have you at the bigger agency levels 
you get overhead that doesn't contribute value to what you pay for. And so there's, there's just a dissipation of your dollars. And so to put it another way, your dollars are just more expensive to spend. Whereas you can go in with a crusher or kind of in-house person or even like a freelance person that you can hire in-house that runs all your paid media stack, essentially what like uh, agencies here do. That gives you, again, more of that partnership level, and it's more of a fixed cost in terms of you would just pay – most people will charge a retainer, so you'd pay 5 10 k whatever a month. Uh, monthly, you know what you're going to pay, agnostic of uh, spend. And so that's, to me, a little more amenable. The, the rub there is a lot of crushers, like freelance crushers, ironically, aren't great like promoters for themselves, and a lot of agencies that are – I don't want to say subpar in terms of performance, but their marketing and promotion is superior to the output they deliver when you pay them. I, I, I said that nice, right? It wasn't yeah. too dickhead. No, no, okay. no, no. Yeah. That was pretty, yeah. pretty yeah, right. cash. Yeah. 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 So that, that's how I would weigh it. And so personally, for me, from a brand's perspective, I would personally prefer to go an in-house route. Um, and then hire creative. So that's the other thing that you're, we're assuming here is that you have creative. So creative is going to be just as big of a piece, um, of the puzzle as a media buyer. And until you have kind of both of those intact, um, it's going to be challenging because even the best media buyers are going to, you, you know, you have to give them something to work with. And so you can do some things that you can still make inroads with kind of small amounts of creative, but to scale really, um, you're going to need to be pushing like creative set a different way. The pace in which you can scale is a function of creative velocity. So the faster you can put out creative, the faster you're going to be able to scale. And so that's the kind of if there. So I know it's kind of a fence answer. Personally, I would prefer an in, uh, in-house person, but I know they're a lot harder to find. And so as that timeline truncates, you, you know, you can definitely try an agency. The one thing I would say, though, with the agency stuff is if you're holding them to those kind of like three ROAS metrics, it's really hard for them to fudge the narrative. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that I've found in agency life is so many agencies don't report or kind of under report or have a very unique talent of wrapping numbers that say one thing to, you know, imply another, so to speak. But anyway, I'm kind of going off into the weeds again but i would say in-house for me but i there i know a lot of great agencies and honestly if you do go the agency route i would try and get one that already has a creative output so you have one poc and you can just work with your agency and they can kind of handle everything um and then if you do go the in-house route you're probably going to have to get some sort of creative agency outside of that to support your media buyer but i didn't give you as much heat as you wanted i'm sure matt but that that's kind of just where i land no man, that's all good. I I don't want just spice for no reason. Like, uh, like you didn't pick the spicy salsa today. That's okay. You're you're feeling it's a little it. more mild yeah. and it's yeah. <laughs> it's all good, man. Uh, it was a good answer, and I think it gave a lot of people, myself, a lot to think about. Um, okay, so now, what is? Um, you've been around the block once or twice. Mm-hmm. You, where have you seen brand owners, friends, colleagues, any people you've tried to help or mentor or been a mentee at times over the years? Like, what's once someone has success and reaches that seven figure mark, they mm-hmm. reach a million dollars in revenue. This is a magic number for some reason for all of us yep. in entrepreneurial land. What is one of the biggest pitfalls in like? roadblocks or challenges that then come up at that point that probably wasn't an issue before um yeah definitely for me the biggest thing is revenue watching where you need to be profit watching so there's a lot of companies that like don't tell me your revenues tell me your profits because uh again going back to that vc math and actually a a past client that i was working with he made uh, over a million dollars in revenue for his uh uh, DTC business and he took home negative 28k. So, um, that is big, big no nos. And so again, he would have seen that in terms of POAS as well as net profits, net margin. But my biggest thing when you get big is 
how like what's your cash flow where's it going and then what are your profits like what not only profits but like what are you able to take home because there's actually kind of a a bit of a conundrum or paradox but there's profitable businesses that can't take any money out of the cash flow because that cash flow is already committed to the next cycle of inventory and so even though matt your uh you know clothing business is quote unquote net profiting a million bucks you have no other powder outside of that million bucks. And so you have to roll that million bucks right into operational costs and inventory again. And so even though and that that's kind of where the financials get really important, because as an ad agency, I can be like, dude, look at this. I mean, that's exactly what happened to my client, where it's just like, look at this. Oh, my God, 100K revenue a month. That's awesome. How much do we make in profits? Net 10K. Why did we spend 60 grand to lose 10 grand? Like, what the hell is going on here? But if you're revenue watching, you know, kind of dick measuring, if you will, it's, it just doesn't, <laughs> it, it, it isn't, uh, one, looking at the business through one lens is never a good thing, but looking and kind of being married to revenue is so seductive. Uh, but it's really not the path. Like, really, at the end of the day, you care about your net profits. You don't really, like, obviously, your net profits are a function of your revenue, so you do care about your revenue, but, um, if you just focus too much on the top line, you can get lost in a lot of stuff. And then what happens is those mistakes become really big. And so you just spent 20K on an ad agency. And guess what? That ad agency didn't do shit. And so now you just ate 20K on the P&L for that month. And then you just start having these big cuts come out. And then you realize, oh, my gosh, out of that $10,000 we made this week, I only kept a 1,000 of it. And so without looking at profits when you're at that scale is uh, can be a recipe for disaster. Uh also a name of a popular book is profit first so look at profits uh when you start to scale up rather than just revenue okay that is awesome to know and a good point there we're gonna wind down a little bit because time is flying by but it's been great i know uh i have i have a new sales call at 10 minutes so i should probably be on time Uh, (laughs) so, (laughs) so i'm winding it down um i love it cool where um <laughs> what is what is your uh view or what is one of your personal hypotheses hypotheses that you have about marketing uh and black friday like for the next 3 months like for the rest of the year like Ooh. tell me a little bit about give me a little taste about what what we all are coming to in the next three months. Yeah. So hopefully this doesn't come to fruition, but I think it's going to be doom and gloom. Quite frankly, the markets are tanking right now. Supply chain issues are a huge deal. Actually, one of my clients just ran out of stuff that they ordered six months ago. It usually takes six weeks. It's going to be backed up another two months. Um, and on top of that, you're going to have clients looking at last year, which, I mean, I can't think of a more like anomalous economic year than last year where it's just, bananas to comp to last year there's just no no way but at the same time like that's the easy right you're we're armchair quarterbacking like telling your client like oh but don't worry about last year because this year so i i'm i'm in a way very pessimistic about black friday cyber monday this year i think it could be a real shit show um and with that being said a lot of that's going to fall on kind of the heads of media buyers where it's like why are my ads working this much blah 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 um so that's one of my kind of hypotheses i hoping it doesn't come true and i think there will be some people that do kind of come through it but even the likes of nike and other just monsters are having issues so if they're having issues like those are the people that have literally dedicated supply chains and so you don't more than likely if you're at under 10 20 million dollar run rate so i think that could get pretty ugly and then my other kind of big hypothesis outside of the mini CMO era is I think attribution will stay broken. I think channel agnostic metrics are going to be the only way to deploy paid media. I, I don't see any way with Apple. The incentives for Apple to keep pounding the privacy drum is they're just too high where it, it doesn't economically make sense for them. Like privacy is literally becoming a feature for them. And that is the differentiating feature between Android and Apple, right? Where it's like Android will stock you, but it's a way cheaper phone, still pretty nice. Apple, you're the rich person that you won't have. We won't show anybody your data. And so I just think that the incentives there are going to be really challenging for Facebook um, or, you know, at all any, any media buying platform. And so 
not to say that they're not going to be as effective. Like I think the efficacy is still going to be there. It's just you're going to have to buy in a smarter way. Yeah, I think iOS 14 weeded out a lot of the. It's a great I just way to took a course. I just took out. I just took a course. I'm charging a client 2k a month, and I'm just signing a bunch of clients and outsourcing all the work to these random people. And mm-hmm. like I think that's what it uh, is weeding out. I don't think Facebook is dead. I am seeing some of my clients increase improve yep. since then right absolutely not all of them some of them and yep. so uh i i love that last point about the just using the different metrics and like measures to determine uh how your media buying is going where can people find you what are you going to plug this is your 30 seconds yeah okay cool so i am at, at robert Ray, Ray Hill on twitter but that's not important what is important is there is an amazing app for analytics you can hook up your shopify snapchat facebook ads all this stuff has all the metrics to talk about it's called triple whale one login one dashboard all the metrics plus a mobile app at try triple whale on the twitters and then try triple com. and then we also have a awesome newsletter called whale mail you can subscribe right on our twitter page boom and you have a podcast oh yes buried the lead thank you matt and, and we have a podcast called you are not your roas uh by triple whale so it's available on all of the podcast places and then we have it on uh, youtube as well awesome dude lovely to chat and connect and we i'm sure we'll talk again soon yeah Appreciate this is your... great we'll, we'll have to get you on the pod too this is this is fantastic i love, love it. it great great awesome. vibes yeah thanks for your time and uh everyone listening thanks for tuning in catch you on the next episode